Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Good Stuff. As always, we're glad that you're here today and spending some time with us. Um, you know by now, but you can check us out on YouTube, Good Stuff with Kevin. Appreciate the subscriptions and reach out on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Well, today we have the head coach of Texas A&M women's basketball, Gary Blair. Coach, it's great to have you. Thank you. It's not too many times you can get me away from my haircut. I just got the haircut <laughs> done. I'm ready for national TV or podcast, whatever we call today's world. There you go. You're looking good. Well, hey, you know, last two weeks ago, we had Brandon Sir, uh, and now you're on here. I, I, that's enough wisdom in, in two weeks for me than I know what to do with. So uh, there, there's a lot that you guys are offering the guests, so we appreciate it. I mean, 32 years as a head coach one losing season that sticks out to me right away being a former coach uh how's that even possible coach surround yourself with good people let them work recruit for your system not necessarily your wants but recruit for the needs be realistic and i've been very very lucky i've been in the right place at the right time and Basically, I'm a product of Title IX when I first got started in high school when Title IX was coming in 72, 73. And I was coaching at an all minority school, Dallas South Oak Cliff. And the girls came over next door and asked me if I wanted to coach. At the time, I was waiting around for a boys baseball job or a boys basketball job. And that's how I got started by accident. Title IX was very good to this little old guy that used to have darker hair than this. Yeah, I know. Well, I, I think it's extremely impressive, though, uh, in terms of the resume. And, and to me, just as much as being at one place for almost 20 years now, I mean, that that's hard to find. You started there in 2003 and just you're still going strong. Like, wh why has it been such a fit for you and what makes that university so special? Texas A&M had been a sleeping giant for a long time. And uh, I think a lot of times back in the uh, early 80s when Jody Conrad took over University of Texas, she built a program where the rest of the University ofs, as I call them, the University ofs were not ready to put that much money into women's basketball. You had the Wayland Baptists, the Delta States, the Immaculatas, uh, and then you went to the Louisiana Techs, the Western Kentuckys, the Long Beach uh, State. And all of a sudden, it just started coming your way. All the way from high school, where I went into uh, a boys' athletics jacked. It would sort of be like Chicago Marshall or East St. Louis, Lincoln or Galveston Ball. So mm -hmm. I got to start something from scratch. And we definitely had the athletes, what they needed. They needed me and I needed them. And so mm -hmm. then I went on to Louisiana Tech as assistant in 1980. And did pretty good recruiting. If you notice yesterday, one of my former players I recruited out of East Texas, Teresa Weatherspoon, just got the uh, assistance job at the Pelicans in New Orleans. Right. So finding the right people, I love to evaluate. It's more fun when you sign them than when you lose them. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember losing Cheryl Miller mm -hmm. and, uh, my president at Louisiana Tech couldn't understand why she wouldn't want to come to Louisiana Tech. We just won two national championships. And Cheryl said, I'm going to go to USC where they had the best communications uh, and broadcasting program in the country at the time. And that's what she did. And then she won the next two national championships. Yeah. <laughs> and we finished second and third. So yeah. each time you remember the highs and the lows, but if you're afraid to get on that ring or that telephone and compete against the best, you're never going to be the best. And right. I've been very fortunate to be at programs that were built for women's basketball. Yeah, I, I tell you, I, I think it's so important. We talk about this even in the business world and sales. It, it's good to even get a no. It's great to get a yes, but you just got to be willing to, to ask. And, and I think 
to your point earlier about recruiting, I always remember when a recruit would call me and say, well, Kevin, you know, you guys finished second. Well, it didn't matter if I was second or 90th, right? I mean, if you didn't get them, you didn't get them. Um, but I guess going back to, to, to getting there and, and building this program, I'm sure the vision you had was important. But like, was, was that the key or what, what else allowed, I guess, what else allowed you to get to the program to where it was today? to where it is today, excuse me. Basically, I'm the first hire of Bill Byrne who came from Nebraska. And Bill saw a vision and actually one of his former coaches, Paul Sanderford, used to be at Western Kentucky, uh, he's the one that recommended me. And he recommended Leon Barmore, the, the man I learned everything from at Louisiana Tech. Barmore was, he was never leaving Ruston, so I was the second choice and uh, it worked out perfect for me. And I was leaving a top 25 program at Arkansas. Before that, I left a top 16 program at Stephen F. Austin. And before that, I left a national championship program at Louisiana Tech. So there's no way I wanna build from scratch but at the same time, I had to do that at Texas A&M. We were the worst program in the conference. I always used to say the conference office was stronger than we were, but we found a way and that's all you can do. But Bill Byrne, the athletic director, he had a vision about turning all the sports into winners, not just football. Football hadn't won a national championship since 1939. So why not build up your whole total athletic program? And that's what I bought into. And Bill did an excellent job at Oregon. Then he did an excellent job at Nebraska and then an excellent job at A&M. So I'm a product of Bill Byrne and now his son, Greg Byrne, is the athletic director at Alabama. Right, right. Yeah, that, that, that's crazy to me because when you come in, it's the conference's worst team. Um, you know, you haven't had a winning season in seven years. The attendance is low. You know, that's, that's just not the most attractive situation. You buying into that vision and having one on your own. Is, is there something, though, that you can speak into that somebody listening to this call, whether in the sports or business world, if they're just starting out, whether it's something to do or even not to do, you know, what, what, what would you say to them from your experience in building this up? Well, particularly if you're a younger coach, work under good programs. Don't take a job just to have a job. And then as soon as you get there, you're starting looking for another job. You got that cell phone working outside the office. You're looking for another job and you're a job hopper. When I look to hire somebody, I'm looking for stability and people that understand what a program is and build and what can you add to the program. And what I do not do is I do not hire bobblehead dolls, people that go up and down like this. I want to hire people that might be better than I am in certain areas. Now, of course, I'm still the boss and we agree to disagree but I think that's what too many young coaches come in before they try wearing my size 11s, sit there and realize and think from both ways. There's a lot of ways to win and there's not just one right answer. Sometimes there's a lot of different answers and study the game, learn the game. And here's the difference. I live the game. There's a lot of people that love the game, but they're not going to put in the time and the work, particularly early in their career. What is your library like? Do you even know who Brendan Sir is? Do you Mm -hmm. know the writer John Maxwell? All the different books that you can help increase your vocabulary, increase your thought process, and increase your vision and the spinoffs that you can get from coaching. Even if you get out of it after 15 years, I'm going to hire you at State Farm Insurance, okay? Because you've learned how to communicate with people and you've mm-hmm. learned how to sell. So that might be my next career. I'm never going to go from State Farm Insurance into coaching, but right. I might go from coaching into State Farm Insurance. 
Yeah, so good, so good. What What would you say? I'd just be interested to know over this time. What has coaching taught you? Humility. Be humble, or you'll stumble. Uh, coaching has taught me. I've got uh, Jennifer White. She's now an official. Was two-time national champion at La Tech. On the wall over here, which you could not see, is a quote she gave me my last year at Louisiana Tech. She had it all monogrammed and stitched and said, today I gave all I had. What I kept, I've lost forever. I try to go in every day and I look right up over my TV. Mm -hmm. Is this going to be one of those days I'm just shuffling papers or I'm making decisions or am I procrastinating? or if I'm growing. And this is the the one thing at the, when we won the national championship in 2011, this is sort of a little funny thing. Uh, all of a sudden I got a little box afterwards in the mail from Staples, said congratulations. And it was easy. That was easy. Well, no, it wasn't easy. I keep this on my desk to remind me how hard winning that national championship and the breaks that you had to have along the way. And so a lot of times when I finally accomplish some paperwork, I'll hit this thing and then my administrative assistant in there, she'll start laughing. Well, he finally got something done today. <laughs> so sometimes That's you great. have to be humble. Yeah. And you've got to be able to share the responsibility and accountability. And I've got a great staff that I'm able to do that with. That's awesome. And ironically, Brendan and I talked kind of about the same thing and how the game can't humble you. And that's it's probably one of the greatest things about sports is knowing you have a chance to win, but knowing you can get your butt whooped on any night too. Well, I guess in, in turn then, what, what do you hope to teach your kids, you know, when you're coaching them? a different way, uh, more of a, I've been called uh, way back when I was young, you probably not even old enough to remember the actor, Jimmy Stewart. Okay. No, no. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm a slow talking guy that gets my point across. Yeah. I, I used to yell and scream a little bit more younger in the career. Mm -hmm. Now I sort of, try to do it a different way because today's kids are different on how you approach them. Some you can give the tough love, some you can kick in the butt, but as soon as you do, you've got to be able to hug them and tell them a different way. And boy, you did this thing right, just right after they threw the ball into the fourth mm -hmm. roll of the stands. And so you've got to find your way. You're coaching a team, which you're trying to make into one, but at the same time, you're coaching 15 individuals that all have certain needs and strengths and weaknesses, believe it or not. They have weaknesses just like us adults. And here would be, I've said this before, speaking in engagement, my biggest pet peeve in life is adults refusing to admit to mistakes. I didn't say 18 to 22 year olds. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about adults. And here were their teachers and their mentors or their parents. How many times do you see us go, my bad, uh -uh. we justify. Mm -hmm. And this is what I think needs to happen to get this world back together. Life is a compromise. Uh, it's special. Uh, uh, marriage is a compromise. I just got married uh, 12 days ago. So I've got a beautiful wife now, and we're going to get through the latter part of our years in life. And uh, But I promise you one thing, I've learned what compromise is all about. Right, right. right. Well, congratulations. Yeah, and you know what? I think it's – I heard Coach K, I think it was on J.J. Reddick's podcast not too long ago. To your point, what you were just saying, I'm, I'm not – I understand what it takes to be successful, and so do you. It's the sustaining excellence that I'm so intrigued by now. And one of his things that he said on there was adaptability. I think his message and what he was saying hasn't changed over time, but it's how he's saying it. 
you know, whether it's the shoes he's wearing, being involved in the Instagram, does, is that what you're referring to? I mean, what you've probably said is you're getting your point across, but maybe you've tried different ways to do that now based on the generations, if you will. I've done it. The generations, uh, you build a team around a point guard. Okay, I don't care how many stars you got. You build a team. It's a love-hate relationship. That's what my grandson is, is a little point guard. And he's always Love. looking for little nuggets from me to give him or something. Like he uh, tried to take four charges. Three of them worked, but he got into foul trouble. And I said, I said, Logan, last night, you got to get lower and a little bit wider. You're already only 5'8". They can barely see you in there. So quit waiting for the thing, sell it on your stamps. And Kevin uh, Shisheski, I've learned so much from, and thank heavens he's a year younger than me, and thank heavens Bayheim is a year older than me. So I guess at our age, we're still producing. Yeah. And, and uh, let me tell you a quick story. Uh, I got to meet Coach K for the first time. Joel McEwen, the coach at Northwestern, one of my best friends. We went out to Colorado Springs and we played a round of golf first at Broadmoor. And then the next day, our kids were in the USA basketball trials and they both made the team. So that night we go out to dinner and sitting there at the Cowboy bar and restaurant up on a hill beautiful we're just out there looking and talking about our coaching lives and drinking a glass of wine and just saying hey this is the best of the best and in walks uh sean who's in charge of usa men's basketball and mike shisheski and his assistant they're walking through and we're sitting out there on the patio out there and they wave at us they go back to their private room we're out there with the common folks on the patio looking at the mountains and drinking good wine and so eventually sean comes back and he says uh hey how y'all doing sean was sort of the gopher for usa basketball in 96 when i helped coach the jones cup team over in taiwan Okay, I said, Sean, I'd like to ask one question. I've been in Coach Knight's uh, office when they were out of town. I've been on the lawn. I've played four games there. I've never met him in person. I'd love to ask him one question. And Sean says, sure, when you finish your meal, come on back, have a glass of wine with us. Well, we went back in this little private area, and I sat down there next to Sean, put my keys on the desk there, started talking to him, and I said, Coach K, as we get older and relevant, how do you stay relevant in your latter years? Even though you got a program like Kentucky or Duke or UCLA or Indiana, how do you stay relevant and touch today's kids? And he thought for a minute, and he said, uh, Gary, I've followed your career, whether he has or not, but he has said he did. I was impressed. <laughs> and uh, he said, they're going to get the best out of you every day. He won the national championship in 2011. Now it's 2019 at the time. You're a better coach now. Your life has changed, but they're going to get the best out of you every day. And you've got to get your kids to believe in that, not just show the ring that happened 10 years ago now, but they're going to get there. That's what they're going to get out of me every day. But at the same time, I've got to circle around my assistants and my support staff, my managers, my role players on the team. Yeah, I've got first round draft choices, but how do I keep it going and going and going, just like what Bayheim is doing, just like the great ones have done in the game? Because everybody's always wanting to say, well, it's time to let somebody else come in. Well, I'm giving them the best out of me. And that's, that's why I'm on coach. I've got no retirement date. I've got, 
I'm going to coach when I can still make a difference. I'm not going to coach for wins. I'm not going to coach for money. I'm not going to coach just to have a Kennedy Carter, who was one of the best players in the country and still is today in the WNBA. I'm going to coach because I can make a difference and I can teach the game, but I better be humble because it's not too far from that penthouse to the outhouse. I don't yeah. want to have that fall. Yeah. I don't want, when I can't win at the highest level, it's time to move on and let a younger person do it. That's great. That's great. That's, that's, that's really good. Uh, oh, wait, good Kevin, stuff. I, forgot, I forgot one thing. Go ahead. I picked, up, I picked up the keys, went out the door, got into our uh, black Nissan and drove away, and Joe and I was just knuckling and high five and went to the hotel, parked the car, went in, whole nine yards. It all comes back to I took the wrong car. <laughs> I took Mike Krzyzewski's car because his keys were on the right. I picked his up, and so for three days, we had a stolen car report, and I haven't apologized to Mike Krzyzewski yet, but he finally got his, and Sean got his computer, and I got my golf clubs back. But I stole Mike Krzyzewski's car. That's great. So yeah, that pull, is a, that's a good part of the story. I pull for Duke all the time. There you go. Come after me. We'll send a thank you out here via social media and see if he gets it. Um, I would just be curious then over time, like, is there, is there one thing that sticks out to you that has changed from, from, from the beginning till now, or at some part, like, is, is there just something that you would say, you know what, Kevin, this is what's the biggest difference, whether it's in the profession, whether it's with the athletes, whatever it might be, what comes to mind for you, coach? The thing that I need I think teams need to do is realize and don't take it personal when kids are changing or adults are changing jobs or kids are transferring. 700 kids last year transferred in women's basketball. There'll be 1,400 this year. And particularly if they pass that uh, transfer rule. If, if you did this every day of your life, if you ran into a wall and found a way you could go around the wall, sometimes you got to hit that wall head on and learn to climb over that wall or get yourself through it. I see too many people in life that are changing jobs for another $2,000 a year here or a better situation or more playing time as a player or the parent's ego isn't satisfied because their son is not starting or their daughter. Yep. And they change high schools. They change summer league teams. Yep. Then they go to a college as a big time recruit. They're not starting me because they're playing behind a senior who's a little bit smarter and more team orientated. And so they transfer and then they have to sit out and all of that type of stuff. People, stay the course, be loyal, sign with a program with teammates and a head coach, okay? That's what you've got to do, sign and have loyalty. And I think that's the thing that has changed so much. There's no loyalty, sometimes even in this world today. Yeah, right, right. We just saw it in uh, the last presidential race. Sometimes there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, I, I mean, as much success as you've had, you know, on paper, there, there's still been a little failure from time to time. Like, like when you first started there, or, you know, just in, in, in terms of your career, has that been your greatest teacher as a coach or person, or is there something else that comes to mind for you? Uh, you, you learn like it is, uh, I was very lucky to never have started at the bottom, except when I first started South Oak Cliff, Title IX, but everybody else was at the bottom too. But Louisiana Tech was already a powerhouse. Stephen F. Austin used to be a powerhouse. They were three and 24 when I took them over when the great late Sue Gunner had uh, gone uh, to LSU. 
So I had to start that over. Arkansas, I had to start over, but at least they were close to 500. A&M was at the dead bottom. And so we recruited like heck. I had a great staff and, uh, and that's what you do. Uh, Vic Schaefer came with me from Arkansas. Kelly Bond came with me from Arkansas and we worked our tails off. Uh, we brought Johnny Harris in, who's uh, just a great motivator and teacher and recruiter. And we worked and we worked and we worked. And then we learned how to sell the program. And this is what a lot of coaches will not do. They want to coach on the floor, but you've got to coach in your community. Mm. I've been a Rotarian for 29 years. Good for how, you. Many, how many coaches yeah. actually will take the time to join a service club or a Sunday school class mm -hmm. or yep. anything? They're into their selves and the winning and the losing more than they need to be into the community. And that's what I try to do. Uh, I can talk to a fire hydrant, but I'm going to let the fire hydrant talk first if he can. When I sit down at a rotary meeting, what's going on in your life? Not just yeah. did I beat Texas on Saturday night or did I lose right. Cheryl Moore in recruiting or did I get Teresa Weatherspoon? Right. Uh, I think that's what you have to do, Kevin. Uh, give back to the game. The game has been good, so good to us. Now, like you're not coaching at Ohio State, but what you're doing, you're giving a service out to young people and young, young coaches that are fixing to go into their dreams. Mm -hmm. And that you're just as important as that Ohio State coach for what you're doing giving back to the game. Now your paycheck's probably not the same, Definitely. but at the same time, you've got a ministry that you're providing for people in teaching and coaching and mentoring. You're, you're helping those state farm insurance agents or those mm -hmm. oil field workers or those nurses who have been first responders. You're helping right. all of us. Right. Yeah, that's for sure. Thank you for that. But I would I would want to know how much of this we talked about this a little bit off the air, but like how, how much of this of what you learned in the Marines and thank you so much for your service, but how much of that has carried over to your coaching philosophy, Gary? Well, a lot of it, you you said experience failure. I w I had to flunk out of architecture first change majors to uh, kinesiology. Back then it was called physical education and journalism. And I, I wasn't a salt to the earth in the classroom. I was just a hard guy. I should have raised my hand more and asked for help. I'd sit back and didn't do it. So I ended up going in the Marines after I dropped out of college with one year to go. I was going to take a break because I was just burned out working, paying and not being very smart, carrying on a social life and ran out of baseball career also because I was a walk on 128 pound center fielder who could catch like Willie Mays, but couldn't hit like Willie Mays. And still number 24 is in my heart, just like Kobe is in all of our hearts. Okay. But I ended up getting a draft notice out of the blue and out when I was managing restaurants. And so then they said report for induction in LA in five days. And so when I went in, my hair was this short. I'd been running restaurants. I'd just gone to Chicago to get this one out, a bankruptcy up there. And all of a sudden the guy says, well, you're on your way to Fort Ord. I said, no, sir. I'm going to join the Marines. I said, nobody joins the Marines after you've been drafted. We take a few of you. And I said, I'm joining the Marines. And so I learned in a hurry that that's something I've always wanted to do. If I was going to serve, I wanted to be a Marine. And through boot camp, I was the oldest one. I was 23. Everybody else was 18 to 20. Two of my drill sergeants were 22, and the other one was about 29. And so I learned what a team was all about. There's 75 in a platoon. If one person screws up, 
we've all screwed up and you learn to have everybody's back just like you do in baseball or you learn to have everybody's back quit making excuses get down give me the knuckle push-ups or whatever however far we will run and you learn to bring everybody together as a team i learned my management skills and how to get along with people of every race while I was in the Marines. I didn't have that at Texas Tech where I went to college because it was probably 98% Caucasian at the time through the 60s. And so I learned and I learned through failure, everything, baseball, architecture, not being able to make a good GPA and so I went into the Marines and when I was over in Okinawa there, cause the third Marine division had just been pulled back from Nam and the rest of the Marines were still in Vietnam. I would manage uh, intramural teams. Uh, I did everything I could to learn that year in there, be ready to serve if called to go from Okinawa to Nam, but be ready to lead at any time. And that's what the Marine Corps teaches you. It teaches you leadership, responsibility, and accountability. And I cannot look. Uh, we play our first game next Wednesday playing Lamar. And at 12 o'clock noon on November the 25th, I'll be up there saluting that flag or my hand over my heart and just say, I was blessed and had a privilege to serve my country, to serve my country. I was not a war hero. I was no baseball star. I was not the architect that I wanted to be, but I found my calling, and that is to teach young people and help them raise themselves up from failure. You have to have failure before you can have success sometimes. Yeah, I love it, man. God bless you, Coach. That's awesome. Um, you know, hey, this national championship in 2011, I know we didn't get into a ton of it. I, I want to, I know you got a lot to do here, so I want to kind of wrap up for you. But the, the national championship being inducted into the Hall of Fame in, in, in 2013, um, I think 1,163 total wins right now. How, how do you even begin to put into words, as I guess, you know, you're, you're not done, but you're closer to the end than than you were you know starting out your career but how, how do you put all of that you know into some type of so how, how do you explain it well that guy on that tombstone is starting to put that little hyphen right between the start but he sure hadn't etched over there on that other side and i'm gonna hold them off because i've still got a lot of goals i want to shoot my age in golf before I hit 80. Okay, I'm 75 now. Okay, I, I want to do it. I can shoot 80 right now, but I can't shoot 75 like I used to back way back in the day. So the national championship year, we had a very good team all year, but we didn't have a great team. We had a junior college post player that was 6'1", 260 and she could move Daniel Adams and she helped put this ring on. You build your team around a point guard. I had Sidney Colson who plays up in Chicago behind Vandersloot right now, a born natural leader. I had Sidney Carter, who's my video coordinator over at the two guard position. I had Tyra White, Adora Lano, who's still playing over in Spain after 10 years. And I had depth and I had role playing biggest accomplishment we had lost three times to Baylor that year who was the best team One seed, the yeah. they were the best team in the country with Griner and Odyssey Sims and others but we found a way in the elite eight but to get to the elite eight and to get to win the whole thing we had to beat five straight Hall of Fame coaches who were already in the Hall of Fame. Vivian Stringer by 20, Andy Landers by 41, Kim Mulkey by 12, Tara Vanderveer, 
at Stanford, who we were down 10 with five to go, and we found a way to come back and win it, and Muffet at Notre Dame. And I felt like by the time we got to Notre Dame, I felt we were as good as Notre Dame. And we played that way in that ball game. The teams in front of us, yeah, they might have been better, but not on my day, not on our day. On our day, we were better. And so you learn to say everybody has their day, but are you ready for your moment? Too many people are not ready for their moment. The other night in that football game, uh, when Arizona, Kyler Murray threw that Hail Mary pass, three people were on him. Hopkins was ready for his moment. Yeah. Okay. There's, there's so many moments in life that pass you by because you're not ready to accept the moment. Are you afraid to lose? I want to take that chance. I want to be that risk taker. I want to be able to run and make that throw like Murray made. And I want to be able to be Hopkins to come down in a crowd and make it. So I live for those moments and hopefully I've got a few more left. Yeah, for sure. For sure. What what would you be anxious for? We hop into to rapid fire here. If you could go back to let's say 25 year old Gary Blair, you know, what would you tell him? I don't know if it'd have anything to do with, you know, uh, teaching Dennis Rodman in class, like you told me, but what, what, what would you, which is, which is, that's probably another podcast in itself. Right. Um, but you know, what would you tell him? Well, I love the, the feature this last spring, the last dance. Well, maybe that was my first dance. Young white, PE teacher coaching at an all black high school in Dallas. Right after integration, it was in 68. I got there in fall of 72. I think mm -hmm. I started teaching Dennis in my PE class in probably about 75. And so I had him 75, 76, and 77. He was five foot 11. And you and I, well, first, you were a college player. You could beat mm -hmm. him, I could. But he couldn't play a lick. He was 5'11". They used to call him Worm was his nickname, I think from playing pinball back in the day. I'm not exactly sure on that story. I'd play ping pong with him at night while uh, after PE class before we'd go into the next class. He never got to really play on the two end baskets. You'd have, that's what we call the chump baskets on the side in high school. Mm -hmm. You had to be good enough to be chosen to play in the two end baskets. So you had 10 on one end, 10 on the other end, and then jump baskets, you get up a few shots. That was PE back in the day. Hmm. We, at South Oak Cliff, we played basketball about 90% of the time. But he was just a good kid. That's all he was. Now yeah. his two sisters, Deborah, who went on to La Tech, won two national championships with me and a second and a third. She ran the family. She was the middle sister. And then Kim went on to Stephen F. Austin. What you learn is Dennis grew eight inches after high school, got better in the rec center, and then turned into a Hall of Famer. The best rebounder that's ever played the game mm -hmm. is Dennis Rodman. And I give him so much credit for developing his own persona don't worry, he weren't he wasn't wearing wedding dresses in my family. Yeah. Uh, he he uh, couldn't have pulled that one off. But he I feel proud for that whole family. Because each one of them, including the mother Shirley, they were all good people that have lived their dream. And I tell the Dennis Rodman story all the time. And don't ever give up on yourself. And I don't think Dennis did. That's great. That's great. Well, let's let's go into rapid fire. And I guess before we do that, though, one one quick thing. Can you give me, though, like if you saw if you had lunch today with that that 20 year old, uh, you know, Gary Blair, is there something you tell him that I think this could be something profound for somebody else listening that's younger? Is there something that sticks out that you you tell him to, to stick with or some type of life advice you'd give him? 
believe in yourself, quit making excuses for yourself, Love it. and learn to be a little bit of a risk taker. Learn to sit there and just go for it. You're looking at Dennis Rodman at 5'11", Gary Blair going to play uh, college baseball at Texas Tech at six foot and a half inch then, 128 pounds. Mm -hmm. You've got to work your way through life and sit there and say, what can you give back to life instead of always being a taker, okay? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you've got so many of us people that are in coaches most of us were, we were frustrated uh, baseball players that couldn't hit the slider. Okay, mm. that's why we became basketball coaches. We <laughs> couldn't hit that doggone thing. And so I want that young person to sit there and not change jobs, not change schools. If you have to change majors, change majors. Don't go major in aeronautical engineering just because it sounds good or petroleum engineering because you're making the most money in petroleum engineering. Go do what you're going to be good at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. What are you going to be good at? Don't just have a job. I don't want to graduate in the bottom of my class. I want to be able to go to the top mm -hmm. and to be there, get knocked down a few times. That's right. Don't let, Mom and dad fight your battles for you. Yeah, Stand up to them yourself. Yeah, good stuff for sure. All right, hey, we're going to go rapid fire. If it takes you a little bit longer, that's fine. I call this three-pointers. So instead of you watching everybody else shoot, Coach, you get to fire away here now. Um, number one, if you, if you could uh, – if people could learn one thing from this talk, talk and kind of grab hold of something, what would you want that one thing to be? guy that is, has experienced failure that has now found success, okay? But you, you've got to experience it. You've got to miss the shot before you make the next shot. You can't be afraid of taking the shot. Right. It's good. It's good. Number two, if, if Coach Blair could have came over here today in my shoes and asked him a question today, what question would have you asked that I did not ask? Why are you still doing it? Why at 75 are you still doing it? Or I just noticed Jim Beheim's at 76, he just got COVID. Somehow I've been very lucky or blessed or very safe and I do not have it as yet and have it and I'll be tested again tomorrow morning. Uh, I've been very blessed but I haven't been sick a day in my life since I was probably about nine years old. So maybe I'm just built with the wrong or the right genes. Right. And then lastly, good stuff is the name of this. Um, something I just tend to say all the time. What is some other good stuff that you could give us in closing, uh, just in general, whatever you feel is appropriate for now? And you say good stuff. You know, it's funny, on December the 13th, I'm playing Abilene Christian, and the coach at Abilene Christian is Julie Goodenough. <laughs> She's a very good coach. Yeah. But that's who I'm playing, uh, December 13th, Julie Goodenough. And I think she's won a couple of national championships when she was either at McMurray or, or Abilene Christian. What is good enough? What is good? What is great? We try to teach our team to go from a shot to good to great, just like the book, from good to great. First, we've got to find out what good's all about. And if you've never reached great, don't be afraid of that moment or it'll pass you by. And we had our moment in 2011. Mm -hmm. but we keep thinking we might've had that run last year if we would have been able to play in the NCAA tournament. So you're not giving, giving my dream up. Uh, you know, see this book right here, 600 mm -hmm. little things, a high school coach 
in Louisiana wrote this thing and Coach Starkey gave it to me because Buzz Williams gave it to him. And I'm just reading about the little things that a high school coach is saying more things than Gary Blair, Jim Beheim, or Mike Krzyzewski or Bobby Knight. And he's putting it in the words of a 25 year old could understand. And I really would recommend this book for young coaches to read. Okay. Got it. Well, uh, coach, la last thing, where can, where can our listeners connect with you, whether it's social media, you know, Texas A&M women's basketball, uh, what, what's the best way to go about that, please? Well, you can find me on the web. You can also find me on Facebook and what is the thing, Twitter, but I give you a hint. My assistants do a lot of that for me because I am tech dumb. <laughs> X and I email and I, I write letters. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Now, but I am tech dumb. My wife has to do, I thought we were still using DVR yesterday. <laughs> and I, I couldn't figure out how to program up things. So I got to have help. So, but we welcome your thing. If we have summer camp this summer, if you're interested in working our camps, uh, write us, let us hear about your story. I always like to bring in new enthusiastic coaches and I want to be able to help the young ladies that are out there that are trying to find their place in this world. And right now, if you're a young lady and you're a college graduate and you learn sports, the doors are wide open, mm -hmm. whichever way you want to go. That's great. That's great. Well, thanks for that, Coach. And uh, I, I told Coach Starkey selfishly, once that COVID's up, I'd love to get down there sometime and catch out a game or practice or if you're ever in the Midwest. It'd be it'd be awesome to, to see you guys in action. So um, you, you said give back probably a, a number of times through this conversation. Uh, I, I want to thank you a ton for being with us today and giving back. There, there is so much in here. Um, you, you've shared so much valuable insight to our listeners. Uh, I know I got a lot better in our short time together, um, you know, and I, I obviously wish you the best this season, especially underneath those circumstances, you know, stay healthy, win some games. But I, I really, really do appreciate you spending some time with us today, Gary, and giving back. I appreciate it. You can see us in action. Uh... The 28th of this month, we're playing at DePaul on uh, Saturday afternoon at 4 oh, o'clock. So we'd love to have you and see the godfather and the mayor of Chicago, Doug Bruno, <laughs> and this little old gray-haired guy going at it. But I guarantee you, they, we won't need a shot clock in this game. There you go. Well, hey, thanks again, Coach, and uh, good luck to you this year. Uh, to everybody else that's out there listening, you know, as always, continue to give us feedback. Love to hear what you what you think of this episode. So, so much in here that I know is going to have an impact on you, you know, your business, your team, whatever that might be. Keep us posted. And until next time, good stuff. And Kevin, last thing. Yeah. Anybody's interested, I wrote a book about two and a half years ago. It's called A Coach in Life. You can get it on Amazon.com. A Coach in Life by Gary Blair and Rusty Burson, or you can write our office. I think we sell them for about 20 bucks. Nice. So it's, it's not a masterpiece, but it's a piece. Yeah, there you go. All right, great. Yeah, so until next time, good stuff.